relate to John the Baptist down in the wilderness baptizing in the River Jordan sometimes. It's really neat to see how each one reacts in a different way, but I can feel the presence of God coming down upon me and upon the person being baptized and just all over the place. Lonnie Frisbee was a hippie seeker who came of age during the 1960s. At the end of his quest for truth, he embraced Jesus Christ and became a Christian. One of the young men, Catherine, who has been so used of God is Lonnie Frisbee. And I wonder if Lonnie could just share with us some now. Well, the people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> he became influential in the Southern California evangelical scene, sparking the rise of two denominations that planted churches across the southwestern United States. And the church for so long has been expecting a certain mold of, of what a Christian should look like or what a Christian should be or what a Christian should say. And God is blowing everybody's mind <laughs> because he's saving he's saving the the hippies and nobody thought a hippie could be saved <laughs> Raised in a troubled home, Lonnie found his escape in painting, dance, and fantasy until he responded to the lure of the counterculture. I went into high school and I started having problems at home and I ran away from home. And the first night I ran away from home, I dropped LSD. That was really something else. And I started taking a lot of psychedelic drugs and uh, smoking grass and and searching for God. Typical of the emerging hippie generation was the thirst after knowledge through direct experience, turning the body into a laboratory for chemical, sexual, and spiritual experimentation. And I found myself going into the cult. Edgar Casey, flying saucers, drugs, marijuana and LSD, uh, metaphysical meditation, hypnotism, all the different things that went along with uh, the mystic, and uh, it, it just wasn't quite enough for me. I, I kept on searching and searching. And... I was on a search for heavenly bliss. I smoked a lot of cannabis, but it did not help me. I did not find a way. One of the ironic twists of the 60s was that many openly stated that drugs LSD in particular, played a large part in their experience of Christian salvation. So we drove out to Talkwitz Falls and we hiked up. He wanted to go to the very top fall. And once we got there, he, he opened his backpack and he spread out and he had LSD and he had marijuana 
and he had all of his oil paints, and he proceeded to paint a picture of Jesus on the rock, a full-sized picture of Jesus on the rock. Then he pulled out his Bible, and he got kind of in a yoga position, and he says, we're going to read the Bible now. He was reading about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist baptized, and he baptized us up at Talkwitz Falls, even though we were all on drugs. Now wouldn't it be a drag if everything I had would all be taken away someday? And what if you worked all your life, made a lot of money and even had a wife, and that'd be taken away, what would you say? Now wouldn't it be kind of sad, why you weren't thinking you weren't that bad? Jesus gazed at you and said, they follow me and do the everlasting fire, boo, yeah. I took my LSD, laid down on the floor a couple of hours, and when I could get together to get up, I got up as a Christian. It's just that simple. Now wouldn't it be kind of nice, if you would just think twice before making your hasty decision. People are starting to open their eyes, they're getting fed up with all these lies, and with all these phony religions. They're starting to see hope in one Jesus Christ and all he's done He ain't no religion You're set free with love from the sun, yeah Love from the sun Love from the sun Love from the sun Whoa. Sometime in 1967 at the age of 17 Lonnie Frisbee took another trip into Takeets Canyon there he took a hit of LSD, removed his clothing, and began to pray in a relatively unorthodox but sincere manner. He would later recount that it was here that God came to him in a vision and told him of the unique role that he was soon to play. Samson was a man with some great big muscles who seemed to always get himself in all kinds of tussles. The power of God was heavy on his life, but it only caused him tremendous strife. Now Samson knew that God had called his name, that his power was tied to his long flowing mane. He was filled with the spirit with lions and Philistines he fights, became leader of them stubborn Israelites. Yeah, they were stubborn. Stubborn, all right. He said he saw like the Pacific Ocean emptied out of water, but filled with people raising their hands, crying out to God to be saved. He said he saw a sea of humanity crying out to the Lord. He said the Lord told him that he would have a unique ministry and that he was not to be afraid. When the Lord called me, I, went, I was going into the desert and I was taking all my clothes off and I'm going, God, if you're really real, reveal yourself to me. And one afternoon, the whole atmosphere of this canyon that I was in started to tingle and get light and it started to change and I'm just going, uh-oh, I didn't want to be there. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God hit him hard and he went almost into a trance and he saw himself standing up there with a Bible and he was preaching the gospel powerfully to young people, and God told him he was gonna use him to bring young people to Christ. And then the Lord showed me that there was a light on me that he was placing on my life, and it was Jesus Christ, and I was going to go bear the word of the Lord. The history of human spirituality is full of moments like those where the recipient claims to receive a message from God, but the significance of these events is not found in the vision of light or the burning bush, but rather what happens afterward. The tremendous zeal by which the person embraces the calling. Whatever happened to Lonnie Frisbee in the canyon that day so transformed him that it shaped the course of his entire life. He just changed my life. I entered into something that the Bible calls the born again experience. I was transformed on the inside. I, I became a new creature in Christ Jesus, and the old things passed away. And uh, so I started telling other people about it. I, I wanted everybody to experience the experience of Jesus Christ. But when I first turned on the drugs, I thought that was the truth, so I turned everybody on the drugs. I put away my rolling papers. Got 
touch with the risen Savior. I started telling everybody about Jesus, and that resulted in I lost everybody. <laughs> I lost my parents and my brothers and and friends, all my friends, they just left me. They, they marked me off as a fanatic, and I was crazy, and I flipped out on another trip, just maybe like what I did when I was on LSD. Except this lasted, and it was real, and it was solid, and it changed my life. And I, I immediately started to grow my hair a little bit longer than it was, so I, I really looked like Isaiah's grandson. <laughs> I wore St. Francis of Assisi shirts with hoods on them and wore robes and things like that. Energized by this experience, Lottie immediately started telling others about this dramatic encounter. He left Southern California accepting a scholarship to the Academy of Arts in San Francisco, putting him in the middle of the city's emerging Haight-Ashbury district. It was here that he came into contact with a group of new converts who in response to their reading of the New Testament had sold all their possessions and decided to live together in a Christian commune called the Big House. And I was confronted with the fact that I was always putting down Jesus and saying that they probably had it all screwed up or anything, but I never actually read the New Testament, you know. <laughs> so I did, and I really liked Jesus, but he was so different than I thought he was. It was a complete surprise to me. He was so cool. I mean, I would have thought from what I had heard around from Christian people that he was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, you know? <laughs> it was, you know, or, or at least a Republican, <laughs> you know? Wanting to reach out to others seeking after truth, the members of the big house opened a storefront crash pad called the living room located in the heart of the Haight-Ashbury district. Every day, they would make the half-hour drive from Novato to the living room to invite the locals in for conversation and soup. The kids around Novato began knowing that, you know, they heard the word out that there was a hippie community. I don't think they realized when we said Christian what we really meant, how, how, how Christian we were. We were 24 hours a day trying to figure the Lord out, or trying to figure ourselves out relative to the Lord. It was on one of their trips through the hate, they ran into Lonnie Frisbee, fresh from his experience in Taquitz Canyon. I met a fellow, uh, and he's in a situation, he's living, he wants to move out or something, but we can bring him home a few days. And... Some of the times he would be talking about Jesus being a person from another world, you know, who came out of a flying saucer and other times, which is not unusual in those days. Invited to live at the big house and participate in their experiment in Christian community, Lottie was steered toward a more orthodox understanding of Christianity. But his thirst for experimentation did not stop. He found affinity with Pentecostal preachers whose sermons focused on dramatic spiritual encounters and miracles. He said, well, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? I go, well, I don't think so. I don't even know what that is. He says, well, let me tell you about it. I felt the Spirit of God come down upon me in such a powerful way. And Lonnie was kind of encouraging me to start speaking in this unknown prayer language. The turning to Jesus takes many forms. In this little church in Redondo Beach, the youngsters come to pray in what they believe to be ancient tongues long since dead, unintelligible in modern America. They claim that Jesus got the monkey off their backs. For 45 minutes, I had my hands in the air, and I was under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then at one time, Lonnie had a feeling that if he took his deer skin, of course, he was a little eccentric. We probably all were. And he painted a picture, a likeness of either Jesus or himself. It's debatable. <laughs> And he put that, uh, and, he, and he wore it around his shoulders, and that was pretty good. I got a deer skin to be my mantles. And I painted a picture of Jesus on it, and I wore it like a cape.
So when I would pray for people and the Spirit of God would come on them, I'd take off my cape and throw the mantle over the top of them like this. But then he got the idea that if he put this sheet over people, they would manifest Holy Spirit and begin speaking in other tongues. And it did. A few, it, this happened that way a few times. A couple times. A few early, you know. Then he thought, this is how, this is how this the This is his Spirit ministry. Is. One day, Lonnie announced to the members of the big house that he was going to hitchhike down to Southern California to reconnect with a girl that he had known from his drug days. He came back down looking for me because he told them that he was going to go get the girl that he was going to marry, which was news to me. So he's talking to me about Jesus, and he's reading to me out of the Bible. He goes, are you ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And um, it was like everything just made complete and total sense to me. And I said, yes. And he took me down into that pool of water, and he baptized me. And he says, I've got to take you and, sh and introduce you to some people. And so um, there I go with everything I own in my little backpack uh, up to uh, Novato and moved into the big house. Then a man dressed in a robe stood up and said, Two thousand years ago I rose from the dead To free all mankind from the curse of sin But you men won't listen, you're just too ignorant So I'll tell you one more time again He pointed his finger and this is what he said I could change, I could change your heart I lived there for almost a year before he proposed. He didn't tell me that he wanted to marry me because he loved me so dearly. I don't know what I was thinking. I think it was because he asked me, I said yes. My poor generation laments and wails, crowds the institutions. A feature article on the members of the big house in the January 1968 issue of Christian Life magazine caused quite a stir in Christian circles. The article landed in the hands of a pastor named Chuck Smith, who was wrestling with his feelings toward the hippies. Back in the late 60s, when our conservative Orange County was being shaken by hundreds of long-haired kids, because we had children of our own that were in high school and college, my wife was deeply concerned. Chuck and Kay were, uh, they used to sit on the streets in, in uh, Laguna Beach and watch all these hippies walking along and wondering if there was any way to reach them. And I remember Chuck said, Kay, you know, it's too late. They're too far gone. I, I think they're beyond help. And he said that Kay just broke down and started crying and said, Chuck, don't say that. My feeling was dirty hippies. Why don't they take a bath? Becoming something of an itinerant missionary, Lonnie Frisbee had been hitchhiking from Northern California to Orange County when a chance meeting landed him on the front steps of Pastor Chuck Smith's house. After struggling for 17 years, never being able to gather a significant congregation, Smith was contemplating leaving the ministry when Lonnie Frisbee walked into his life. And so one evening, about five o'clock, our doorbell rang and there was John, the young fellow who had been dating our daughter, and with him, a real honest-to-goodness hippie. Long hair, beard, flowers in his hair, bells on the cuffs of his pants, barefooted. And John said, Chuck, I want you to meet Lonnie. The meeting between the straight conservative pastor and the street-level evangelist was electric. Smith's comments hint that something otherworldly took place when the two met. And Lonnie extended his hand, and there was such a warmth and love manifested in his greeting. I was caught off guard. There was an instant bond. There was a power of God's Spirit upon his life that was very easily recognized. My parents were fascinated with him, fascinated with his understanding of scriptures. Like he, he talked like scripture was today, it was right now. So he came to church that Sunday night, and the church was real small at that time. On Sunday evening, there might be 
30 people, 40 people on a good night. And Lonnie made a hit. I mean, my parents begged him to come back. We invite you all to come with us and sing a song of praise. Come along and sing with us and together we will praise him. Singing praises from our hearts will walk with God this day. Lifting up our voices will sing a song of love. During the first Calvary Chapel service that Lonnie and Connie Frisbee attended, Kay Smith, the wife of the pastor, uttered a prophecy which some Christians believe to be the direct communication from God. I believe that, that that night my mom received a prophecy about Lonnie and Connie having a, a very broad impact, like a worldwide impact to their ministry. And one night we were sharing our testimony in the church for the first time, and we were at the altar praying that night. There were 15 of us at the altar praying. And the Spirit of God came through a prophecy with K. Smith and said to us, Because of your praise and adoration before my throne tonight, I'm going to bless the whole coast of California. And I thought, Woo, she really thought of a dilly tonight. <laughs> and when we started to receive the word as from God, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon us and we began to weep. And the Lord began to give people visions of that prophecy. And then the Lord continued on to say that it was going to move across the United States and then go to the different parts of the world. Some seed fell by the wayside. Some of it fell among thorns. Some of it fell upon stony ground. These would never for they would not believe that when the sower was gone, the reaper would be coming around. Hurry, take what you got, do with it what you can. Cause the good God in heaven needs a sower in the land. My dad and mom were so convinced that this was a wave of God's Spirit and that all of these people coming to Christ uh, represented the new church. For the first four years that I was there, all he preached on was love because the, love at that time had so many different meanings. And I think um, Chuck hit the nail on the head. He just basically said, God is love. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> that's the answer. Rather amazingly, the experiment worked. The zeal of the newly saved hippie preachers started to pay dividends as the church started to grow. Lonnie was teaching on Wednesday nights, and uh, his Bible studies would just pack out with with hippies, with you know counterculture. They were all there. For a lot of the hippies, he embodied, you know, the, at least the image of Jesus. And there weren't five guys like him. There was just Lonnie. He was the guy you looked to, and you said, "That's the hippie preacher at Calvary Chapel." The doors blew open at that point, and Calvary grew from about. 200 to 2,000 in about six months period. And that was the beginning of uh, what is now history. Throughout the Bible, we are confronted with historical figures said to have held special powers, granted by God to perform acts that promote faith, but defy rational explanation. Early on, he was a little whacked out, but he was powerful. God's anointing always uh, got on him, people copied him, tried their best to do like he did. Lonnie gets up on this bench and he yells, here's this little skinny guy with long hair, and he yells, hey, hey, God loves you, come to God. And all these people just got up off their towels and walked forward and got down and, and they were weeping as he was leading them to the Lord. This woman uh, leads, she starts leading this man in and she said, we were over at Calvary Chapel and they told us to come over here that somebody would pray for my husband, he's blind. And I went, here we go. <laughs> this is going to be good because Lonnie's sitting right here. He looks at the guy and he goes, in the name of Jesus Christ, you can see. And the man got his sight back. I was scared to be with Lonnie because my, my, my faith, born out of Lutheran tradition, meant that you had a certain level of of Norwegian social grace involved in, in your relationships. To be with Lonnie was not to be safe. And 
everywhere Lonnie would be, God was doing things. And it was almost like a, a, a kind of a fun thing to do to sit there and watch when the anointing would hit him because it was like two different people. You know, he was goofy and, and kind of almost embarrassing when he was himself. And then all of a sudden, at some point, the spirit would hit him and all of a sudden this authority would come on him and he would speak with absolute authority. Things won't ever be the way they used to be with a magic man. Conservative Christians, especially Pentecostals, will use the catchphrase anointing to describe these unique individuals. An anointed person is recognized by the power and presence of God upon their life. Lonnie was just running to catch up, you know, it was just at whatever he did, it seemed to just these miracles and phenomenal things happened. Lonnie didn't ever try to force that. I don't know anybody else who I've ever felt this way about and I'm I'm rather skeptical today when it comes to you know claims to to charismatic but with Lonnie it was like walking with an apostle someone who is tuned into a divine frequency I watched him very closely I watched off to the side looking for anything phony that I could anything artificial any pretense I could and I never saw it people would fall down in the spirit and, and then we, I started hearing stories about healings that lasted. Um, Lonnie didn't put on any pretenses like other preachers did. He didn't ask for money. And I kept looking for all that stuff. He was true blue. And I love that. He spoke his mind. He didn't care what he said. And that was a big impression on me that um, this guy's got the power of God. How can I deny it? As Calvary Chapel began to experience growing pains, the relationship between Chuck Smith and Lonnie began to change. My, my mom and dad always had, you know, this theology, this Pentecostal theology, but they had, there, there were things of the practice of Pentecostalism that they did not feel comfortable with. And he told Lonnie, he said, if you pray for people and they fall down, you're going to lose your job. He did not want this happening at Calvary Chapel. And so Lonnie goes, Debbie, we can't let them fall down. So we'd be praying for people and holding them by the hair to hold them up so that they couldn't fall. The relationship between Lonnie and Connie also began to strain, as Lonnie continued to spend every waking moment involved in ministry activities. My dad's philosophy of ministry had harmed Lonnie and Connie's marriage. Um, I know that, that Lonnie and Connie both had talked to my dad about this. I remember making the appointment and, and the, he asked me what it was for and I said, well, marriage counseling. And, um, uh, and then Chuck Smith told, uh, looked at me and he said, the only thing that's important right now, Connie, is that people are getting saved. Um, and my dad's belief was that um, the hierarchy of values was God ministry family. I could just tell that Lonnie knew, now had a carte blanche to be as irresponsible as he wanted to be. And that's when, um, that's when I felt like I, had to, I was fighting God for my husband's attention. Feeling his brand of Pentecostal ministry wasn't being appreciated, Lonnie accepted an invitation from another ministry to leave Calvary Chapel. The church claimed that Lonnie had left Calvary Chapel to work on his marriage, but this simply wasn't the case. Lonnie felt that Chuck Smith's restrictions were too stringent. Around Calvary Chapel, we felt Lonnie's leaving was a great betrayal. I mean, I, I know the feelings uh, of all of us. It, it actually left a lot of painful wounds in Calvary Chapel and a very negative feeling towards Lonnie. But leaving Calvary Chapel was not as he planned. And only four years after he had left, Lonnie made a phone call to Chuck Smith asking to return. And the next time I saw Lonnie Frisbee, I could not believe it. He was an assistant pastor at Calvary Chapel. He was in a three-piece suit and a manicured beard. But no doubt about it, my spiritual reaction was he's been incarcerated. My dad did uh, open the door for him, put him on staff. 
uh, had him do um, afterglows, believers meetings, and uh, and yet I would say it was it was very very different. In only four short years, Calvary Chapel had expanded into a movement with satellite locations all over the southwestern United States. Chuck Smith had replaced the aggressive Pentecostal dynamic with a focus on Bible teaching. And rather quickly, Lonnie realized he was an uneasy fit and started to look for other outlets to express his more aggressive Pentecostalism. He found a kindred spirit in John Wimber, the pastor of a Calvary Chapel satellite location in Yorba Linda, California. John and I met three years ago at the pastor's conference, and the Lord told us that he was going to join us together, and it's taken three years to do it because I'm a chicken. We started circling the Calvary Chapel of Yorba Linda. John, Wimber, and Carol asked Lonnie to come over for dinner. So I was Lonnie's roommate, so I went with him. He says, I think that I would like for you to take a Sunday night. In fact, why don't we do Mother's Day? At the time of his invitation to Lonnie Frisbee, the question on John Wimber's mind was simple. Why were the miracles he read in the New Testament not happening today? I think the Lord's going to meet us tonight in a special way. So I want you to be in expectancy for a move of the Spirit of God. He asked people 25 and under to come forward. And so we had all these young people, probably 300 or so, uh, go forward. He just says the words, Holy Spirit, come. Almost immediately, uh, this, everybody just fell on the floor. There's a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the young people here. The Spirit of the Lord is moving upon these girls right here. And one of the kids, uh, his name Ricky, when he fell to the floor, he pulled the microphone down. Well, a lot of them started speaking in tongues. Others were crying. But the sound was uh, uh, shocking. <laughs> and we, I didn't know what to do. I stared at this whole thing. I didn't know Lonnie. Uh, John was shocked. He was sitting there. He's trying to figure out what's going on. A lot of people got up and laughed, and, and they were angry and uh, whatever. Even though Wimber and his church members had been praying to see God move in their presence, there was a considerable uproar the day after Lonnie preached on that Mother's Day meeting in 1980. We had to have a special meeting like a couple of days later with all the elders. They want to know what in the world is going on here. Lonnie comes back up and disrupts John and says, listen, the Lord just spoke to me. I don't care what kind of issues you have here. What needs to happen is you need to have an encounter with God. In the aftermath of the Mother's Day event, Wimber took the opportunity to create his own movement, differentiating themselves from Calvary Chapel along theological lines. He took leadership of a fledgling denomination called the Vineyard, enticing a number of Calvary Chapel churches to change their affiliation and take on a more aggressive Pentecostal outlook. So John would speak and Lonnie would minister. They were the dynamic duo. Lonnie got up there and he waved his leather coat and uh, the power of God would come and people would be falling all over these, these old pews in these uh, Baptist churches. And Lonnie would start climbing over the pews and laying hands on people, and he'd say, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. And he'd hit them in the forehead, and they'd instantly begin to speak in tongues. So I was, I was blown away by that. So I came to the vineyard one night, and I had my mother with me that night. Something had happened in her mouth, and she had broken out with black lesions on her tongue and the roof of her mouth and all on her gums. And Lonnie walked up to us and said, what do you guys need? And all of a sudden, Lonnie stops back and he says, you foul spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of that woman. And my mom started coughing and hacking and retching. And when she stopped, her mouth was healed. And so I was going, wow. For many, accounts of miracles are met with skepticism in an age when religion has been associated with fraud and deception. You got that? I want you to get that out. If it's a ten, I want you to get that out. 
If it's only a dollar bill, I want you to get that up. I said, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Thank you, Jesus. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Even some Christians find it difficult to separate the credible from the counterfeit. But the stories about Lonnie have a different feel to them. Even those that were ambivalent toward him as a person shake their head in wonder as they recount what they saw with their own eyes. You right there, it <laughs> starts going, the Holy Spirit's coming upon you right now. And I'm like, what's happening to me? I was just starting to get baptized and fill the Holy Spirit. And I mean, this none of this could have been suggestion. Yeah, no paradigm Hypnotism, for it. nothing, because I hadn't, I didn't know what it was happening. It was happening to me and I didn't know it. And it started before he even got close to me. Never manipulated, never tried to make anything happen, never did anything. And then lifted up his hands like this and just pointed towards people and said, the Holy Spirit is resting on you. Though little credit is given to Lonnie, he was influential in the formation of what the Vineyard Church movement called the Signs and Wonders Theology, a paradigm of teaching that suggests that all Christians could operate in a similar manner to Lonnie, that they too could perform miracles like they'd read in the New Testament. As with his tenure at Calvary Chapel, Lonnie was at the Vineyard Church for only a few years, but once again, he provided the initial spark that ignited a tremendous attendance growth and subsequent formation of a church movement. The blazing sun, the morning star, the spirit to lead the way. I got a telephone call one day that this young man who was in the, the church here in Laguna Beach was feeling really bad, really convicted, really guilty. And he confided in uh, his pastor that he had had a six-month affair with Lonnie. One night I, I went to the vineyard on a Sunday night, and John and Carol asked my wife and I if we had wanted to go out and have a cup of coffee with him after church. We did, and we're talking. And I said, John, I want to ask you a question. As far as Lonnie goes with his homosexuality, is that something that you just show him mercy with? And John said, how do you know Lonnie's homosexual? Has he told you himself? And I said, yes. He has. Many conservative Christians believe that homosexuality is a sin. Bible verses are often cited from Leviticus and Romans, branding this behavior as unnatural. The next day, John called me. He said, I spoke to Lonnie today. I asked him if this was so, and he admitted it. He confessed that it was so. And he said, I let him go, I terminated him. Well, no, we pulled him out of visible ministry, and that's the thing Lonnie had a difficult time with. Uh, he'd be talking, meeting with people, and I'd want to know, what are you doing? And I'd go talk with people and ask him, I want to know, it was Lonnie hitting on somebody. So we kept putting more and more, you know, boundaries on him, and finally he left. He just felt we were unjust in our treatment of him, and uh, which is fine. Opinions are sharply divided as to whether Lonnie was a homosexual. His friends believe that even though he may have once defined himself as being gay, that after his conversion to Jesus Christ, he renounced homosexuality and always maintained it was a sin. Though he may have lapsed back into this behavior on occasion, so they reason, he was never a practicing homosexual again. When Lonnie asked me to marry him, at that particular time is when he told me that he was gay. He didn't say it as though he was still gay, but that, that he had been saved out of that lifestyle. Lonnie was not a practicing homosexual, that he might have fallen into the sin uh, and given over to some things at different points of his life, but he certainly wasn't practicing that, and he certainly wasn't practicing that, that around me.
There are other friends who suggest that Lonnie's sexual behavior was indicative of a lifelong struggle, one that simply did not go away with his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. At the end of the marriage, he told me that he had been staying late in some gay bars. It was a hard thing for me to understand how he could party on Saturday night and preach on Sunday morning and the Spirit of God moved and there was no doubt about it. I think that's one area of his life that never uh, got, it was never broken, he was never free of it and it remained hidden away and would manifest itself very secretly, very privately. There is a minority, however, who believe that the biblical passages about homosexuality have been misinterpreted and that their own experience at the hands of conservative Christians are similar to Lonnie's. When you're desperately trying to please God and you think because of the church's teaching that to please God is to not act out on your sexual orientation, gay or straight, then that terrible struggle begins. Because conservative Christians look upon sexual sins as being more grievous than other indiscretions, Lonnie was branded an outcast and treated with contempt by those he had helped establish in the ministry. It was a bit of an open secret in the church community about Lonnie's moral failings. And, and I really believe John, near the end, became concerned that it could significantly undermine the vineyard. And just the fact that we let somebody who was a practicing homosexual minister, and we didn't know it. Um, so you feel remorse for that? Yeah. 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 Lonnie was not wise enough to understand that people constantly wanted to use him for his anointing and throw him away as a human being. Lonnie in tears said, Daryl, nobody wants me in their church. He said, they like the goodies, Daryl, but they don't, but they hate me. What did he say to that? You know? Maybe hate was too strong with a capital H, but you know, when people are willing to rip pages out of a history book. There is no mention of how influential Lonnie was over the growth of the Calvary Chapel or Vineyard Church movements, both of which have grown into worldwide denominations, each with more than 1,000 churches. But it also bothered me that somebody who had had such a dynamic impact on a movement was was written out i thought how could that happen because no matter what somebody does that doesn't wipe out the good that they've done it doesn't make good bad i mean is john trying to <clears throat> write him out of the history is how, how would you suggest? we're not no we don't we don't write anybody out of history we'll admit that god used lonnie frisbee to do certain things to us right. and we're we're not ashamed of that but bob in in, in, in the books john calls him the young man he never names Lonnie. Lonnie is, is, is the young man on Mother's Day. And what's that? See, the truth is, I didn't read John's book. I mean, I lived it. Lonnie's misfortune is he got caught. Because there are a lot of charismatic homosexual ministers right now. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's OK as long as you don't get caught. I'm saying that that we need to find a way for them, find a way within the body of Christ to love and minister to them and accommodate them. But by the church closing its doors to this issue, it drives us out into the darkness. And in the darkness, we do things because we're afraid, because we're alone, because we don't know how else to do it. When that morning finally comes, All the great and all the small, everyone will be there. Cutting his ties with established church bodies, Lonnie turned his focus toward independent missionary trips to foreign countries. Privately, he began to focus on some personal issues, including sexual abuse. When Lonnie was eight, he was molested by a babysitter, and that was an ongoing thing, which I didn't know about. As Lonnie realized how sexual abuse had so shaped him, 
He became upset that many of the people he had worked with were so blind to this issue and hadn't reached out to help him. Blamed his dad, blamed his stepdad, blamed Chuck Smith and then John Wimber. You know, and, and he really, really had a difficult time with these men and what they represented. In the late 60s, early 70s, molestation was not one of the issues that people wanted to deal with and the kind of impact that it would have on people. I need to tell you that I moved in big circles with big bozos. <laughs> Lonnie's bitterness, I think he was entitled to it, if I can say that, I mean, if anyone's entitled to bitterness. I think that both my dad and, and John were like father figures to him, but fathers who rejected him. And that had to be extremely painful for Lonnie. And I think uh, it's, it's part of the tragedy of his life. So I think that there are two areas to blame here. I think Lonnie's to blame because he became independent spirited. And I think the church is to blame because it never recognized who they had in their midst at the time. All the rich and all the poor, everyone will be there. In the early 1990s, Lonnie went to the doctor for some tests and found out that he had contracted HIV. Within four months, he had developed AIDS. It really kind of hurt my feelings a lot that he didn't even entrust in me enough to let me know where he was and what was going on. It really, it really bothered me a lot. <sighs> you know, I asked Lonnie, Lonnie, why don't you just get on a camera and tell everybody why and what happened? Lonnie's response to that was, you know, I, I, I'm in such pain, and I have so much pain and shame about w uh, what it is that I'm dying of. I don't have the, the energy nor the capacity to even do that at this stage. He almost died in October. He had a real bad bout, and I thought, oh, Lord, not now, because he was not good, in a good state. But by the time he died in March, there had been forgiveness, there had been healing. First he talked about his life. And he talked about how much he loved the Lord. And, 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 and then he said, you know, to anyone who has anything against me, I'm sorry. He says, all I can say is I'm sorry. Lift up your eyes, for the fields are already white. At his funeral in March 1993, many of the ministers with whom Lonnie had worked struggled to find the right words. A few of them identified him with the biblical character Samson, a man whose powerful influence was cut short by moral failure. The last speaker was Pastor Chuck Smith, who talked to him a phone call that he had shared with Lonnie only a few days before he died. They had reminisced about what God had done through Lonnie's life to begin the Calvary Chapel movement. Last Wednesday, I called Lonnie. We talked a little bit of that work that God, by his Holy Spirit, had wrought through Lonnie's life back there in the early years of Calvary Chapel. But in his concluding remarks, Smith's comments on Lonnie not living up to his potential disappointed some of those in attendance. A man who knew the powerful anointing of God's Spirit upon his life, but unfortunately a man who never experienced the ultimate of the potential. I often wonder just what it could have been. I came up right out of my seat, and my friends from the big house, Steve Hefner and Jim Dopp, pulled me back down. I couldn't believe that anybody could be so arrogant. 
and have misunderstood Lonnie so completely. That really upset me. And it struck me as so odd because here's a kid who had nothing by way of education or abilities to even educate himself. What he did with what he had, which is what we're accountable for, I don't know if Chuck has the has the wherewithal or the place to say what Lonnie's potential is. If you put it in terms of what did you do with what you got, Lonnie didn't get much and much wasn't required of him, but man, he did a lot with what he had. It's almost as though it was Chuck's opportunity to give Lonnie one last slam. There is a religious body of people who are mad at the fact that God's blessing rested on Lonnie when they think it shouldn't have been. And if they had had their choice, Lonnie would not have had the blessing that he did. But he did. I think Lonnie was a very authentic person. He was an authentic man of God who had a childlike freedom to be used of God. And when he was doing it, he was being authentic. I think he was also an authentic, screwed up person with some very deep, deep, deep pain that he didn't even know the significance of. Uh, God was just, I believe, sending this clown. God wanting to receive the glory yeah. is almost laughing in heaven in, in, in delight and joy at this silly little man with this silly beard doing these silly things. You know, the one thing that uh, gave me great hope was I saw how tremendously God used Lonnie. And I just put myself into that category and I said, well, if God could use Lonnie, he can use me. What does it mean that God placed his spirit on a, a homosexual in 1967? The same thing that it means when God placed his spirit on any of us when we turned our faces up to him and said, oh God, please use us with all our heart we cry out to use us. Because there aren't any of us who have been used who do not wrestle with sinful issues in our lives. My dad made the announcement, if we have to turn away one young person because they're barefoot and their bare feet are gonna ruin our carpet, then we'll pull out the carpet, remove the pews, we'll sit on the concrete floor. These kids have nowhere else to go to connect with God. If we turn them away, where do they go? Now, we can say that about drug dealing, free sex, rock and roll hippies, but not say that about homosexuals. If the church says to anyone, you cannot come here, you cannot engage in the life of the church to anyone, then where are they supposed to go to find Jesus? my soul and you make me whole you're so wonderful 